Okay, thank you very much. And we start this, uh, uh, good morning. Welcome to everyone, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure for me, it's a, uh, an honor uh, to open the, this opportunity uh, of exchange uh, with uh, Mrs. Ziatana Zikanesca, leader of a process of opposition to Lukashenko's government that started four years ago. Thank you very much for being uh, with, with us here. Um, I believe that uh, there is a specific role for think tanks like CHESPI to create spaces for dialogue, testimony, and debate, helping to support uh, civil society, especially where, when it is uh, systematically restricted and, and attacked. Uh, there are institutional diplomatic spaces, but they cannot uh, replace the, the, the need for a direct dialogue between the civil societies of the, of the countries. The, uh, the Amnesty International report, just to quote, an authoritative source paints a picture of a growing reduction of freedom and space for protest and opposition in Belarusia, as well as a worrying, worsening, not only of the rule of law, but also in economic and social condition aggravated by the, the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the creation, uh, but uh, we, we can see that there is a still uh, a civil society aligned that. Uh, uh, we want to, to make his voice heard. So um, I think it's, it's important to hear from uh, the direct voice of uh, the Atlanta, uh, what is the situation, uh, what the real prospects and spaces for uh, the opposition and the civil society, uh, what the, the possibility uh, of the presence of uh, uh, Wagner soldiers in uh, Belarusian territory uh, do they represent a, an internal threat, not only an international threat, of course. Uh, the work we are doing, uh, we are doing is strategic, creating an international networking uh, of support. How can this support be transferred uh, locally on the ground? Uh, after uh, five, um, four years of uh, increasing reduction of freedoms, what is the feeling among the people in Belarusia? And finally, what can Italy do at the, at the government, parliament level, but also at the level of civil society like CESPI? How uh, we can support uh, your work and uh, uh, opposition? And um, uh, among CESPI activities, uh, uh, there is a, a human rights observatory uh, with the idea to uh, study the connection between human rights and foreign policy. Uh, with the collaboration of experts, and many of them uh, have a, a long experience in the Council on Europe. So um, Belarus is not a member, but there is uh, there are systematic contacts uh, in um, from the Council of Europe. So uh, another question is: Can the Council of Europe be an interlocutor uh, for Belarusian civil society, and how can support the civil society? So some, just a few, a few issues, a few questions for the dis discussion. Uh, the idea of today was to have uh, an open discussion with you. So uh, we, we, we want to, to hear from uh, uh, your voice. And then we, we, we will discuss with the people uh, here present in the, in the room and the people uh, at the table. That, uh, I, I want to, to uh, thank them for uh, their presence, uh, um, Gianni Bernetti, former Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Elena Mangelli, Vice President of the Italian Federation of Human Rights, uh, Piero Fassino, Vice President of the Defense Commission of the Chamber of Deputies, and Daniel Durso, uh, the CSP expert. So thank you very much again. Uh, the floor is yours, Zatlana. Thank you very much. It will be heard. Yeah. Thank you, Daniela, so much, uh, dear participants. Uh, let me first of all uh, thank Chespi for holding this discussion on Belarus. Uh, what the future of Belarus will be depends not only on Belarusians, but on the whole of Europe. And unfortunately, it doesn't depend only on um, uh, Belarusians either. This, the situation in our country can be described as a perfect storm. We face double crisis at the moment, political and humanitarian one within the country, 
and the threat of losing our independence. Uh, three developments have been very important lately. First, Russia's decision to deploy nuclear weapon in Belarus. Lukashenko recently confirmed that uh, these are in Belarus already. The second is uh, Lukashenko's invitation of terrorist uh, Wagner mercenaries to Belarus. This is not effective yet, but the preparations are underway. If it happens, it would further undermine Belarusian serenity. And the third is there is Lukashenko's complicity in the abduction of several thousand Ukrainian children to Belarus. This is a clear war crime which should and will be prosecuted by international justice. All three events prove Lukashenko's uh, ever greater dependence on Russia. In the recent PACE declaration, it's called soft annexation. After losing legitimacy in 2020, he definitely exchanged Belarus sovereignty for Putin political, financial, and military support. As the story with the, the Wagner immunity shows, Putin uses Lukashenko's quasi-independence for his own agenda. The Kremlin's uh, eternal goal is to establish Russian hegemony in Europe. There is no doubt that Lukashenko will not control Wagner's mercenaries as he will not control Russian nuclear weapons. His regime is just a tool of Russian imperial policy. Breaking this tool from within would mean a big blow to Russia. According to recent surveys, only 20% of, Belarusian, uh, of Belarusians support the deployment of nuclear weapons in our country. Only 2% support the involvement of Belarus army in the war against Ukraine. But considering the scale of repressions and police terror, it's too dangerous to protest openly in Belarus. 60,000 people have passed through prisons since 2020. Today, about 19 uh, people are detained every day in Belarus without weekends. Only last month, more than 530 people have been jailed. What for? Just for criticizing the regime, supporting Ukraine, wearing the Belarusian or European flag, sometimes just for speaking Belarusian language. There are at least 1,500 political prisoners. The real number might, might be about 5,000. The sentences are just insane. Like eight years was given to Eduard Babarika, who is uh, a son of uh, uh, a person, um, a presidential uh, hopeful, uh, uh, Victor Babarika. However, a, a black swan event like Prigozhin mutiny uh, could open a new window of opportunity for Belarusians, and we must not miss it. We have to stay united and ready for this. Uh, I agree that Europe's future is uh, being decided on Ukrainian battlefields right now, but it, I also believe that uh, free Belarus will be the strongest sanctions against Putin and crucial help to Ukraine's victory. The fates of Belarus and Ukraine are intertwined. They will not be free Belarus without free Ukraine, but also uh, vice versa. Therefore, we ask for uh, our Western allies to increase support for Ukraine, but also for freedom fighters in Belarus. Belarusians and Ukrainians are fighting today not just for their countries, but for our common values. And fight for democracy is a global one. And we are in this fight together. This fight needs energy, needs passion, and strong commitment. This fight is hard, and it cannot be won alone. It also means friends and allies who not only believe in freedom, but are ready to contribute in it and invest. Uh, we need an orchestrated international efforts, and our strategy on Belarus includes uh, four key elements, pressure, assistance, accountability, and commitment. And only a combination of these efforts will give us the desired effort, effect. So a uh, more uh, detailed describing of uh, our, of our um, uh, strategy. First, the pressure. Uh, 
let's not have illusions. Dictators cannot be appeased and dictators cannot be re-educated. Only coordinated pressure can force uh, the regime to retreat. And I ask the West uh, to increase economic and political pressure on Lukashenko's regime and Russia. Sanctions should be monitored and enforced. We also need to sanction judges, prosecutors, propagandists, military officials, and key sector of economy that fuel the regime. Sanctions on Russia must be imposed not only for invading of Ukraine, but also for undermining Belarus' sovereignty. It must send a strong signal that such attempts will not be tolerated. Second, accountability. Lukashenko must be brought to tribunal alongside Putin and all their cronies. Lukashenko has a long record of crimes, including crimes against humanity, uh, crimes of aggression, uh, extrajudicial killings, hijacking flight, orchestrating migration crisis. Now we have evidence uh, that Lukashenko took part in uh, deportation of Ukrainian children to Belarusian territory and our task is to deprive Lukashenko of immunity and designate his regime as criminal. The West should stop pretending that Lukashenko is a president. He is not. Uh, our language uh, actually shapes our reality. So let's stop calling him president. He's a criminal who seized power. Instead, Belarusian democratic forces should be recognized as legitimate representative of the Belarusian people and they should be treated accordingly on the international level. Third part of our strategy is assistance. It's vital to support Belarusian civil society, media, democratic forces, and Belarusians in exile. Only a vibrant and well-informed society will be able to confront the tyranny of Lukashenko. Yes, we currently have resources from our partners from democratic countries to sustain the movement, but we need resources to win. Uh, at the moment, we are strengthening our political structures, uh, the United Transitional Cabinet and Coordination Council. We are working on the common plan of action. We are in contact with people on the ground and uh, the resistance network. The fourth commitment. What we need is a European perspective for uh, Belarus. We have to return Belarus to Europe and Europe to Belarus. Belarusians must feel that they are expected in Europe and international organizations. They need to see the alternative to Ruski Mir, to Russian world, to Russian imperialism. The strategic importance of Belarus for Europe's security might be uh, should be recognized by uh, our Western partners. The withdrawal of Russian troops and nuclear weapons from Belarus must be a part of the post-war arrangement between Ukraine and Russia. The non-nuclear status, neutrality, and independence of Belarus are not negotiable. Only the free independent Belarus will be a cornerstone of the region's stability and Europe's safety. And all the agreements between Lukashenko and Russia must be revised. Belarus should leave the collective security treaty organization so it will not be allied with the aggressor. We will seek uh, to integrate European structures and be trustworthy partners for our European neighbors. Free and democratic Belarus had to be the donor of peace, but not uh, a source of const constant threat. And I firmly believe that uh, this day, a uh, day of liberation of Belarus will come. The two usurpers and their cronies uh, can't hold back history. In 2020, Belarusian people made a clear choice for democratic European future. And we choose the road from tyranny uh, to freedom. And uh, of course, I realize that uh, this path is rather long, it's rather difficult, but I ask uh, all of you to um, walk this path together with us. So thank you. Живе Беларусь, слава Украине. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I open the, the discussion uh, with you uh, and I give the, uh, the floor uh, 
um, first to Gianni Vernetti, and then uh, um, to Piero Fassino, and uh, finally um, to um, Dario Durso and uh, um, Eleonora Mongelli. Uh, the, the discussion in is open, so you can use the uh, microphone. Zatiana, um, you, you can answer and you, uh, no, open the, the discussion, uh, follow the discussion whenever you want, and then we can open the discussion also with the, uh, the, the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very honor, Mr. Tikanoskaya, to be here with you to have this discussion on the future of Belarus. Uh, first of all, let me underline that you have a very successful visit in Italy. I think it's very important. I think that uh, Italy as a whole, on a very strong bipartisan basis, starting from the Prime, Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni, uh, following with the establishment of a very strong bipartisan support group within the parliament, the Senate and the Chamber. So I think in this couple of days, yesterday and today, you have a very successful visit and we are very proud that let's say, all the component of the political landscape from the left to the right to the center on a very bipartisan way from the government to the opposition in Italy and were very supportive of the Belarusian cause. So I think that I would like just to underline and I think that that's a very positive step that Italy undertaken. And thanks also to, to your, your very important visit yesterday and today in Italy. Second, you underline a very clear uh, situation today, so that is that is worsening day by day. So the deployment of nuclear weapon uh, poses a real threat for the European security. The possible, it's not clear how it will be the outcome, but the possible deployment of the Wagner paramilitary military forces bases. Uh, there, there are intelligence news about seven, eight thousand soldiers of the Wagner private military group will be deployed possibly in Belarus is another threat for a clear threat for European security. The continuous threat to use Belarusian territory for the Russian operation in the Ukraine war. So all of these design a clear, a clear, a, a clear situation where Belarus is more and more a threat for not only for Belarusian people, but a threat for our European, European security. So I think that really sanction accountability is the role. Uh, appeasement of a di dictator is not the solution. My question to you is, is that one. I think that more and more Europe and the single European country in Europe as well as a wall, the West, the democratic West, need to recognize the uh, organization of the opposition as the real representative of the people of Belarus. Like happened on the 9th of August 2020, you were elected, you are the president elect. So the legitimacy of Lukashenko need to be clearly and openly challenged. So don't you think that could be a credible outcome for the Belarusian opposition to establish something like a government in exile that could be really became, could be even be recognized with, with, a, with a further step uh, in challenging Lukashenko authority? Can... Okay. okay, so um, now Piero Fassino. Bene, buongiorno a tutti. Saluto, saluto la signora Tikanovskaya, che mi fa molto piacere incontrare ancora una volta. Ci siamo, ci siamo incontrati già più volte, sia di persona sia... Eh, online come oggi, quindi grazie molte di questa sua visita in Italia. È una visita importante, come ha ricordato adesso Bernetti, che ha potuto registrare, ha fatto registrare ancora una volta il sostegno, la solidarietà piena della politica italiana all'opposizione bielorussa. Eh, io credo che sia questo un dato politicamente molto importante sia le forze politiche che stanno al governo, sia le forze politiche dell'opposizione, sono tutte schierate a favore dell'opposizione eh, bielorussa, la sostengono, esprimono impegno e solidarietà a stare al fianco dell'opposizione bielorussa contro il regime di Lukashenko. E la visita della signora Tiganiuska le consente di rafforzare e consolidare ancora di più questo, eh, questo legame. Il regime di Lukashenko è una dittatura, come tutti sappiamo, 
una dittatura feroce, spietata, lo dicono le condanne di tutti gli oppositori, lo dicono la repressione costante e continua della polizia nei confronti di chiunque protesti, lo dicono le azioni di repressione quotidiana contro giornalisti e operatori dell'informazione. E non è soltanto una dittatura, un regime, ma è anche un paese vassallo di Putin e che in, questa, in questo momento, nello scenario complicato e difficile della guerra in Ucraina, svolge un ruolo di appoggio, di sostegno e di partnership con la, con la Russia di Putin, tant'è vero che Putin ha deciso di dislocare e Lukashenko è stato ben, eh, ben contento di accogliere di dislocare armamenti nucleari russi in Bielorussia. Quindi quando parliamo della Bielorussia parliamo non soltanto di un paese che ha un regime politico interno, dittatoriale, ma parliamo di un attore della guerra russo-ucraina con tutte le conseguenze che questo, che questo può comportare, a partire, come ha sottolineato la signora Tikhanouskaya, dal rischio dell'utilizzo di armamenti nucleari con tutto quello che si può immaginare potrebbe conseguire all'uso di armamenti nucleari. Quindi io penso che intanto ci sia questa necessità di mettere in guardia il mondo dal rischio nucleare che la guerra russo-ucraina sta comportando. È evidente che l'uso di armamenti nucleari determinerebbe un mutamento radicale dello scenario. Non saremmo più di fronte ad una guerra, saremmo di fronte a un evento catastrofico, terribile, che si, si eh, eh, diciamo scaricherebbe su milioni e milioni di persone in Bielorussia, in Russia, in Europa, con tutto quello che si può immaginare. Abbiamo conosciuto anni fa che cosa ha rappresentato l'incidente di Chernobyl e come l'incidente di Chernobyl abbia rappresentato un enorme, gigantesco rischio eh, per la vita di milioni eh, di donne e di uomini in Europa. Eh, siamo oggi in presenza di eh, gravi pericoli per ciò che riguarda la centrale nucleare di Zaporizia in, in, in Ucraina e a maggior ragione diciamo, l'eventuale utilizzo di armamenti nucleari tattici o non tattici, a poca differenza nelle sue conseguenze, rappresenterebbe un salto di qualità della guerra con conseguenze catastrofiche. Quindi io credo che intanto bisogna battersi contro qualsiasi ipotesi di utilizzo degli armamenti nucleari, anche rilanciando sul piano internazionale le iniziative per la de-escalation degli armamenti nucleari, per il disarmo nucleare, per l'applicazione del trattato di non proliferazione nucleare, per tutto ciò che può come dire, andare nella direzione di una riduzione degli armamenti nucleari e dei rischi di utilizzo di armamenti nucleari. E questo è un primo punto che io credo vada ribadito con molta forza, su cui è necessario sollecitare i governi, eh, i parlamenti, ma anche le opinioni pubbliche a eh, mobilitarsi. Un secondo punto riguarda naturalmente la guerra russo-ucraina. È una guerra che si protrae ormai da quasi 600 giorni, non sono diciamo, alle viste eh, sviluppi che possano pensare a una eh, soluzione politica di quel conflitto e quindi noi dobbiamo sapere che siamo in presenza di una guerra che sta continuando e potrà continuare ancora per un tempo non breve. Proprio ieri la Commissione europea ha eh, diciamo, confermato con il sostegno del Parlamento europeo il finanziamento di, una nuovo, di un nuovo programma di eh, aiuti militari all'Ucraina perché possa difendere la propria integrità territoriale, la propria sovranità e io credo che questo debba essere un impegno di tutti i paesi eh, che credono nella democrazia e credono nella libertà, perché in Ucraina non si sta combattendo una guerra che riguarda solo l'Ucraina, in Ucraina si sta combattendo una guerra che riguarda la libertà, lo Stato di diritto, la democrazia, il rispetto della sovranità di ogni nazione e di ogni Stato. Si moltiplicano gli appelli e le iniziative per fermare le armi e per aprire la strada a un negoziato. Naturalmente credo che tutti noi, siamo interessati a favorire ogni iniziativa che possa fermare le armi perché ogni giorno di guerra significa più distruzioni, più morti, più devastazioni. 
Tuttavia io credo che bisogna essere anche molto consapevoli di qual è la difficoltà di aprire la strada a un negoziato. E la difficoltà è data dalla decisione di Putin di annettere le regioni del Donbass che ha occupato, così come prima ha annesso la Crimea. Perché se un paese decide di occuparne un altro con, le, con i suoi soldati, in un negoziato può anche decidere di ritirarsi. Ma se lo annette, come ha fatto Putin, e considera che la Crimea e le regioni che ha occupato sono ormai parte integrante della Russia e non intende minimamente recedere da questa decisione, eh, lo spazio del negoziato mi pare molto, molto esiguo. Io non vedo nell'immediato uno spazio del negoziato, perché non credo che nessuno di noi possa in questo momento dire a Zelensky fermati e accetta che il tuo paese venga mutilato. Mi pare che nessuno lo può sostenere. D'altra parte mi pare chiarissimo che Putin nel momento in cui ha deciso l'annessione difficilmente tornerebbe indietro perché rappresenterebbe una sconfitta drammatica per lui e quindi io penso che lo spazio di un negoziato è, in questo momento non c'è. E Mi colpisce che anche il segretario di Stato Vaticano, Casaroli, facendo il punto sulla missione che il Vaticano ha compiuto nelle scorse settimane, ha dichiarato di non vedere nell'immediato spazi per un, per un negoziato e per una trattativa. E quindi noi lo dobbiamo sapere questo, perché questo significa che quindi noi dobbiamo essere consapevoli che il sostegno all'Ucraina è un sostegno che deve continuare. Deve continuare, deve durare e deve garantire che l'Ucraina possa effettivamente eh, riacquisire la, la sovranità su tutti i suoi territori. O perché Putin si ritira, come mi pare molto difficile, o perché l'Ucraina quei territori li riconquista. Non vedo francamente un altro spazio nell'immediato e quindi c'è una situazione molto difficile. E in questo contesto, quindi, in una guerra che continua, il rischio di un coinvolgimento anche della Bielorussia, il rischio di una, eh, anche diciamo, di un uso di, di ordini nucleari aumenta. Quindi da questo punto di vista dobbiamo essere molto consapevoli che la vicenda, anche per questo, la vicenda bielorussa è una vicenda in realtà che non è soltanto di politica interna. Infine l'ultima considerazione che voglio fare riguarda il sostegno che noi dobbiamo dare all'opposizione bielorussa. L'opposizione bielorussa deve essere intanto il riferimento riconosciuto da tutti gli stati democratici e dobbiamo mettere in campo tutti gli aiuti necessari a che l'opposizione bielorussa possa sviluppare la propria iniziativa. Quello che eh, non so e chiedo alla signora Ticanusca, in questo le faccio una domanda, è dopo tutto questo periodo di lotta molto dura dell'opposizione in Bielorussia e un'opposizione che è stata molto repressa e soffocata dal regime di Lukashenko, quali prospettive vede di un mutamento all'interno della, della Bielorussia. Ci sono segnali che la dittatura di Lukashenko possa conoscere una crisi, ci sono fattori di rottura, di lacerazione e di divisione dentro il regime, oppure tutto questo non c'è, perché naturalmente la lotta per restituire la democrazia alla Bielorussia è una lotta che si gioca sul piano internazionale, ma si gioca anche sul piano interno. E quindi capire qual è la valutazione che la signora Tikhanouska ha fa della situazione interna bielorussa e quali spazi, quali prospettive vede. E qui mi fermo e ringrazio ancora lei, ringrazio Vernetti, ringrazio Dulce, ringrazio tutti coloro che parteciperanno a questo nostro, questo nostro incontro. Grazie mille, onorevole Fassino, e darei la parola a Leonora Mongelli. Prego. Sì. Non, non troppo vicino perché altrimenti rimbomba, grazie. Non si sente, eh?
Okay. Now it's better. So I was thanking Chaspi for hosting this, this discussion, and uh, I was saying that it's always touching and inspirational to hear the testimony from Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, the president-elect of Belarus. So thank you so much for your visit here in Italy. I will focus my comments uh, on the human rights perspective, uh, what we have done as international community, and uh, what still needs to be done after Three years, almost three years after Lukashenko saw the democratic victory to the Belarusian people. With FIDU, uh, Italian Federation for Human Rights, we started following the situation in Belarus years before August 2020. We conducted missions in Minsk. We met with activists from Vyazna, from the Belarusian Helsinki Committee, trying to shed light on a situation of abuses that was worrying for us already at the time. And only the last three years, uh, international, uh, the International Platform uh, for Accountability uh, of Belarus uh, collected 50,000 documents, uh, which I really hope that can be used for trials. And while Vyazna continues to update uh, the number of political prisoners, which is currently at more than 1,500 people. This data includes activists, human rights defenders, journalists, students, academics, and leaders of the democratic opposition. And I have to say that almost the majority of the activists and independent journalists we had the chance to work with are among those political prisoners. And they are fighting today for Because the, the modus operandi of all the touches. Attenzione che non si sente di nuovo, eh? neanche gli interpreti sentono. No, can you hear me now? Okay. I was saying that this is a clear strategy of the regime, uh, the modus operandi of all the dictatorships, uh, because those people were not only working for a free Belarus, they were working and they are still working for the whole democratic community. In fact, Lukashenko's determination to repress Belarusian has never stopped. And three years after the stolen elections, his actions continue to go unpunished. And just let me mention the latest UN report, the United Nations report on Belarus, which defines the situation in Belarus as catastrophic. And also I want to mention the recent communication published by the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders to the government of Belarus, where it is stated that Vyazna members have been facing pressure and persecution from the authorities for 20 years. What is impressive, because we are not surprised, we know that the situation is catastrophic in Belarus, but what is impressive is the response of the Belarusian regime. They say the Vyasna Center created a number of structures in other countries and make use of unlawful schemes to bring money into Belarus. The investigation also found that representatives of Vyasna Center took part in supporting persons who engaged in gross violation of public orders. Well, this is a lie, mm -hmm. and this is exactly an example of how Belarus overturned the reality at the United Nations. And uh, we are not surprised because this is exactly how the regime, like regime like uh, Belarus, like Russia, like Iran, like China, they work. They reject the accusation if there is an evidence of the crimes, questioning the work of the institutions like the UN, attacking NGOs and spreading propaganda. And they are doing so because they act together. And this, this is an important point uh, to understand how regimes know how to be allies in their fight, in their struggle against democratic values. Just a last point, um, I want to say that um, for us it's important that the Russian invasion of Ukraine cannot be addressed 
separately from what is happening in Belarus. These two situations are different, of course, but strictly connected, and our response must take this connection into account. There is no other choice for us than a comprehensive approach to justice and to fight against impunity. And we know that it's only thanks to Putin that Lukashenko survived the 2020 protest and is still continuing to, to repress people. In return, Lukashenko allowed, is still allow, allowing his country to be used as a staging point to attack Ukraine and for Russia. So uh, coming to my last point, uh, I'm, I'm, we welcome the, the two resolutions adopted by the European Parliament and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, early this year um, for the establishment of international tribunal uh, uh, to address the crime of aggression with a jurisdiction to investigate uh, not only Putin, but also Lukashenko, because uh, is responsible for the aggression against Ukraine. He, offered, is, is still offering a, a logistical support to Russia to attack Ukraine. So I think that uh, human rights defenders are united in continuing on this path. We just need a stronger political will and a coordinated approach among democratic countries. And the last point is that when it comes to sanctions, so we strongly advocate for sanctions, economic sanctions and individual sanctions, but also sanctions to be really effective, must be used in a well-targeted way, must be used in coordination with the allies, with the other democratic countries. So from our side, we will continue to push institutions domestically and at international level uh, for uh, the political prisoners, for all those who are in exile, uh, for the victims of the Lukashenko regime, because we know that uh, this will also prevent uh, future aggression, future atrocities. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Um, first of all, uh, Ms. Tsikhanouskaya, uh, Madam President elect, actually, uh, I would like to express my, my personal and I think everybody's admiration for, for your cause for, and for the enormous sacrifices that you are uh, enduring for the cause of freedom and democracy in your country, the cause of your, yourself, your Belarusian opposition. And, and your family. It's a struggle that will, I'm confident, will, will prevail and will finally bring Belarus back uh, to its rightful place in the European family. Um, I've just, I will be extremely brief. I would just like to address some uh, maybe more um, strategic uh, perspective when it comes to your, to your movement, your struggle, and how things are developing now in Belarus. Of course, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has added, has added uh, another layer of, of complexity. So one already complex situation when it comes to uh, Belarus internal uh, situation, Belarus relationship with Russia and, um, and with the, um, and what, and, and, and the struggle for freedom that the opposition is, is bringing on. Of course, what we saw uh, until recently was the weak position of Lukashenko vis-a-vis -vis Putin. What happened uh, with Prigozhin, with the attempt coup, uh, with the attempt revolt by, uh, by the Wagner Group has somehow showed that uh, Lukashenko managed to retain some, some leverage actually, to regain some, some leverage when it comes to his relationship with Moscow. And actually my question would be, you think that Lukashenko might have some more leverage right now and how this leverage might actually translate um, in domestic politics and in the um, opposition struggle. Uh, my second point is related to the, the actual Ukrainian conflict. Uh, we know that there is actually a part of the Belarusian opposition, an embodiment of the Belarusian opposition is actually fighting, literally fighting uh, alongside Ukrainians uh, in Ukraine, I'm talking about not the only um, part of it, but maybe the most uh, 
uh, Chris Peake is one, the, um, the Kalinovsky Regiment, um, which is fighting alongside the Ukrainian army. Um, I would like to ask you, I mean, Kalinovsky Regiment has been growing, I mean, it's been quite effective militarily, of course, but there are now, of course, um, analysis about how this, um, their military potential, their military um, successes can translate eventually into a more prominent uh, political role in, uh, in when it comes to the, the internal dynamics of the uh, Belarusian opposition. So I would like to I would kindly ask you if you could a bit um, talk about that. How is your relationship with them and how you see eventually their eventual role uh, to, um, to the um, to the Belarusian struggle for freedom. Having said this, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, thank you so much for sharing for sharing your. Uh, this. For sharing your perspective on the Belarusian situation, I uh, really appreciate your opinion, and maybe I will answer uh, question by question. The first about uh, recognition of uh, democratic forces. No, I remember when in August and September uh, 2020, I uh, I was advised by some people, you know, to demand recognition of yourself as president of Belarus. Uh, for me, it was rather tricky question because I realized that if I start now demand or ask for recognition, you know, European countries will be uh, swallowed by discussion. Should we recognize, shouldn't we recognize, you know, and this Guaido story was very, uh, very strong at that moment. You remember, yes, Guaido. So I decided to put my energy into uh, different fields, into asking for assistance to democratic forces, into creating pressure to Lukashenko, but not you know, debate, should you recognize or not. Uh, since then, uh, I got de facto recognition uh, of uh, democratic countries of uh, uh, my legitimacy. You know, I'm uh, received uh, on the highest levels by presidents, prime ministers, ministers of foreign affairs, so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe now it's time to uh, try to legitimize uh, not only the facto, but the euro, you know, our uh, legitimacy. Because sometimes, uh, you know, I don't, uh, uh, people call me differently leader of democratic Belarus, national leader, president-elect, thank you for this, because it shows uh, what it means, you know, I won the elections, but didn't, uh, didn't come to office. But when I hear that I'm called leader of opposition, it uh, disinformate people, because in normal democratic countries, opposition is just one of the parties, so coalition of parties who are opposing, uh, opposing uh, the ruling government, and that's it. So it creates wrong perception of the situation. So um, uh, we, we, we would like, you know, for the world call uh, myself and our movement in, in, in one way, uh, not, we are not a position. We are majority of people who are opposing small group of uh, uh, dictator who has, uh, who has power because of terror and because of support of Putin. Not recognized by Belarusian, is not recognized by uh, international community. But yes, you know he has uh, uh, weapon. You know he has uh, brutality. Uh, so and he's he's in um, in his chair. So maybe uh, I have to to look deeply. You know in this uh, uh, question, but uh, uh, you know it it will uh, distract attention from practical ways how to support Belarus. You know to to this debate. It's always very tricky. Uh, question, but uh, we will countries who openly in the resolutions, in the statements, recognized me as uh, president uh, elect and our democratic movement as uh, as representatives of Belarus. 
So uh, I'm grateful for this, and I want more and more uh, governments and countries, you know, to recognize uh, um, this fact. Uh, uh, Mr. Passimo, your question uh, was, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was uh, was the possible development uh, of Belarus at this very moment? Yeah. So, uh, of course, as I said in my speech, now we are facing dual crisis, humanitarian catastrophe in our country and uh, threat to our independence. And uh, I realized that uh, we will not be able uh, to have any transformation of Belarus, any democratization of Belarus while Lukashenko is in our country. So our task is to dismantle this regime fully and start building new Belarus, democratic, where uh, democratic institutions prevail. Uh, and it, it, can, uh, it can happen only when we can get rid of Lukashenko. The situation is uh, difficult because Lukashenko is fully loyal to uh, Russia and uh, Russia is supporting Lukashenko. But what, what else we see is that Lukashenko step by step selling our independence to Russia. He doesn't take care about our uh, national identity. He doesn't take care about uh, 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 population uh, of Belarus. He uh, main task for him is to stay in power, to show that he is the uh, uh, longest dictator in in uh, in Europe, and uh, but it's uh, you know and and you know Lukashenko for many years was the most pro-Soviet Union person in Belarus, and he feels comfortable with this. But our country, our people, wants to move forward. We want to uh, return to our historical roots, and historically, we belong to Europe. Only 200 years we, under, uh, we are in the sphere of influence of Russia, but all the time before we were part of Europe and we want to be part of Europe. And uh, you know wh why uh, we accept this, that one country can dictate their conditions to other countries, how to develop. Uh, Russia doesn't see no, U no Ukraine, no Belarus as separate, independent and free countries, as democratic countries. They want to drag us into the past of Soviet Union. And uh, that's why we have to fight against this. But as I said in my speech, we can't fight alone. It's extremely difficult to uh, fight with the 28 years of, of uh, you know, dictator in Belarus. That's why we need support. So I elicited our strategy, how we fight uh, with the dictator through uh, pressure uh, to him, uh, on him, through assistance to people, through accountability um, uh, efforts, uh, and also for, uh, for um, you know, showing the European perspectives for uh, Belarus. Now I, I uh, uh, also uh, sure, and I said in my speech that the fate of Ukraine and Belarus are intertwined. Uh, until Belarus is not free and independent, there will be constant threat to Ukraine and to our Western neighbors. So that's why I don't want Belarus to be, to be percepted as a separate case. Like now we are focused on Ukraine, we have to deal with Ukraine, and we are leaving Belarus for one day later. We will help you, you know, after the victory of Ukraine. But it, it might be too late. We might lose our country while, uh, while uh, the attention, attention is distracted. Belarus is part of this crisis, and this crisis should be solved in complex. We can lose Belarus uh, strategically. And, uh, uh, and that's why, you know, Belarusian issue should be at every possible uh, negotiation table. You know, we really don't want Belarus to be left as consolation prize for Putin, you know, in, in during these negotiations. And, uh, and uh, I, I also think that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, doesn't, uh, Ukraine without Belarus is not, uh, is not of great meaning for, for, for Putin. He needs both our countries. We have a strategic, strategic uh, position in Europe. Uh, so, um, 
Uh, that's why it's very important for us Belarusians not only to fight with dictator, but simultaneously help Ukraine as much as we can. That's why our military volunteers are fighting in Ukraine. That's why we, at the beginning of the war, our partisan movement uh, tried to disrupt uh, through acts of sabotage on railways. They tried to disrupt Russian equipment going to Ukraine just in, in, uh, with the price of their personal freedom. People who, who, our partisans who now in prisons, they got 20 to 25 years in jail. Uh, on the international arena, we are advocating for every possible assistance to Ukraine, but simultaneously not forgetting about Belarus. We, uh, we as Belarusian nation, we have very, a lot of challenges ahead of us. We are like people without state. And uh, our uh, one of our tasks is to uh, uh, to isolate a uh, regime on the international, uh, like deprive regime of political uh, strength on the international arena. So we ask in uh, all the democratic countries not to work with dictator because you recognize him, but work with democratic forces. We now institutionalize, institutionalizing our relationship with many in international organizations, like in Council of Europe, contact group for or democratic Belarus was established. Uh, we are welcomed in the Council of Europe summit. Uh, we are in the European um, uh, Council, we recently established the uh, uh, consultative group. We hold the strategic dialogue with the USA. So, uh, but, you know, also there is, uh, there is one problem that exists in, um, in, in this policy of, uh, of communication with us. Uh, on some events, uh, countries are holding empty chair policy. It means that they don't invite uh, uh, pre representatives of the regime because they don't recognize them, but they also don't invite representatives of democratic forces because we are not state. You know, sometimes we are told, so we recognize only states. We don't recognize people, but recognize states. Look, we don't invite pro regime people, we don't recognize them, but we can't invite you because you are not this uh, group. You know, and they leave empty chair, but empty chair is a zero. So it means that person voice is not heard on different summits, on different events, uh, you know, uh, yeah, in different uh, fora. And uh, we have to get rid of this uh, policy because uh, we are the voice of Belarusians. We are not the voice of regime, you know, who seize power, who are loyal to, uh, who, who dragged our country to this war. We real voice of Belarusian people. So uh, our situation is not, is not conventional, so we need non-conventional decisions uh, in our case. I'm really grateful for the unity of the position uh, regarding Belarus. We see unity of parties, unity of people, unity of countries, and uh, the example of uh, uh, Italian parliament. Uh, yesterday, the group, for democratic of, uh, the group for Democratic Belarus was launched and it's bipartisan, uh, bipartisan group because opposition and governing parties, they see the situation uh, in the similar way. And we are grateful for this. And uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, underlining the problem of political prisoners. It's really our pain uh, because uh, we see such a level of brutality and repressions in our country. Every single day, without days off, uh, people are being detained for everything. For, uh, now all those who are opposing the regime, all those who are promoting Belarusian national identity, all those who are supporting Ukrainians, they are considered to be enemies of this regime. Just uh, one uh, guy uh, donated 60 euros to Ukrainian army, six years in jail. Young lady was seen in Ukrainian song to support uh, Ukraine two years in jail. And I'm not speaking about sentences uh, that uh, our activists are getting, 15, 20, 25 years. And it's a pity that, uh, you know, we, for three years, we are uh, advocating for uh, paying attention to human rights crisis in Belarus. And uh, there are organizations who are very vocal, who are trying to help us. But for example, UN structures, are rather silent about the situation, you know, in our, uh, about human rights abuses. The number of political prisoners is growing and, uh, you know, no, no, no strong reaction. And the absence of reaction 
regarding human rights uh, abuses, regarding uh, crimes of aggression, uh, hijacking airplane, migration of crisis, is perceived as weakness by dictators. And they think that democracy you know, can't, uh, can't oppose dictatorship. That uh, dem democratic countries don't have enough instruments, you know, to oppose the regime. And now dictators are making alliances, you know, to fight with democracy. And it's high time for democratic countries to show their teeth, to show that they can resist, they can fight with dictatorship. They uh, have enough instruments to fight, but maybe these instruments are not uh, used in full. They're not. They're not so effective because you know, like, it's it's easier to close eyes you know, on, on the situation, then to act decisively. Uh, and as for, as for uh, your question about uh, Kalinovsky Regiment, Kalinovsky Regiment is a group of uh, Belarusian military volunteers, our heroes who are fighting on the front line uh, of, uh, of uh, Ukrainian battlefields. They're fighting with Ukrainians. And of course, all, uh, all those people, our men and women, uh, now they are liberating Ukraine. But understanding the connection between liberating of Ukraine and liberating of Belarus from dictator, they are also fighting simultaneously for Belarus. And of course, they are military people. You know, they uh, want to release Belarus in the same way because they stopped believing in uh, diplomacy. They stopped believing in, uh, uh, in uh, negotiations, you know, in, 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 in dialogue. But uh, I think that uh, peaceful changes in any country are more sustainable. And uh, I, and I, I, you know, I really want uh, changes in Belarus to be uh, to uh, happen without brutality from our side. But I can't exclude anything. We have such a uh, such a difficult world around us. But but my uh, our task, my task now is to. Uh, unite people, unite not around one person, but around our aim. We are building democracy and, uh, you know, many points of view are normal, you know, and our task to coordinate our actions, you know, to uh, stay dedicated uh, to, to, uh, uh, to aims we want to achieve. And our aims are, are common for everybody. Free and fair elections, release of all political prisoners, and getting rid of uh, uh, presence of Russian um, uh, new Russian soldiers on our land, uh, nuclear weapon, and the uh, violence now, uh, of course. So we are communicating with them. We are uh, trying, you know, to to be in good re relationship, though we have different points of view on on uh, release of Belarus. Also, I I'm trying to explain our heroes, our military volunteers that if you now declare that we will come and release Belarus, it means that Belarusians can uh, relax, you know, and just wait until we are being released. But our fight should include everybody. It's everybody's responsibility, you know, for the future of our country. And we can't, uh, you know, say people, now you, you can just uh, sit and wait. You have to be involved. And I see eagerness of people, you know, to continue the fight. Our uh, people in Belarus, they don't have opportunity now to uh, uprise vocally. They can't be on the streets because the price is too high. We are losing the best people. Uh, the most active are fleeing Belarus now because of repressions. And uh, there is a choice to be in prison, not able to do anything at all, or, or to flee uh, Belarus and at least something. And all those people are ready to return back when the window of opportunity will be open for us. So uh, the, the role of uh, uh, our military volunteers in Ukraine also is very clear. They now are frightened in the regime. regime. Regime is very scared of, uh, of uh, Kalinovsky regiment. And it's one more point of pressure on the regime. Because um, uh, our task now is to keep uh, regime in constant stress to show that you can't breathe freely because you keep those people as hostages. Society is boiling, I feel this. When this uh, situation with Prigozhin happened and before there were gossips that Lukashenko is very ill and was about to die, I immediately saw how society was governed. You know, immediately, you know, tons of messages. Are we ready? 
what we have to do. Do we have plan? Are we coordinated enough so people not just sitting and waiting? People are working inside the country. They are building small structures. You know, they are communicating um, between each other. We have so as you know, all the media, alternative media, and bureaus have been ruined. And uh, you know, uh, these organizations had to flip their rules, but we have people's intelligence. We have like people's journalists who are collecting information from uh, from uh, you know you know from inside on enterprises. They're watching closely if uh, some equipment is going through our country. Now they're uh, watching closely if Wagner uh, have have already come to Belarus, and they send this information uh, to our free media for our media to broadcast inside Belarus and abroad. So people do small but very important things in Belarus. And so is information is extremely important. We have to counter propaganda. And uh, we realize that our means now are, uh, you know, technical means, uh, internet, YouTube, Telegram, Instagram, uh, TikTok even. But there are people who can't use uh, internet. They don't know how to do this. It's like all the generation of people or people in villages, and we have a network of volunteers who spread self-made newspapers. It's old-fashioned way of disturbing information, but we have to use this because it's efficient. Maybe I'll be stop here. Thank you. Everybody, uh, thank you, And uh, uh, This is a chess piece, uh, an open space for you whenever you want. You, you can come and uh, and. Uh, Follow our uh, discussion, and uh, it's yes, it's uh, a, a, an open space for you. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, um, grazie a tutti della partecipazione.